the lecture is going to be about large scale limits for quantum gases. I've slightly changed the title uh, to make it fit even more to the conference. It's going to be very basic, so I hesitated a lot between uh, presenting you uh, some of our last uh, results in details or rather making a broad introduction to the subject. And I decided that maybe it's better to just be extremely basic and uh, make sure that everybody can follow. So if you cannot follow, then stop me and ask questions. So it's, going, it's supposed to be uh, accessible to everyone. So in the talk, I will uh, discuss uh, what we can say about uh, I mean, limits uh, when, uh, of a large number of interacting quantum particles. Of course, it's a huge, uh, I mean, there are plenty and plenty of questions, uh, and uh, many people working on that, so I have to make a selection. So it's going to be just a, an introduction to the main questions and with a focus on Bose Einstein condensation, but uh, not only. Um, I will, in fact, uh, discuss a little bit the free gases, so the ones without interaction, just to, to make sure you know it before, uh, before you see, for instance, the more advanced talks about interacting gases. So you should really see this lecture as an introduction to the more advanced talks that you will see during the week. And I will, by the way, try to tell you, so uh, Marcello will uh, speak about this, or maybe Serena will tell you. Okay and so on and so forth. So anyway, so in order to fix notation, I think it's probably better to start with a classical case. So we will consider n identical particles. In Rd, so they evolve in, in Rd. Maybe they will eventually uh, be confined to a domain or something, but this I will uh, hide in the, in the external potential. And there will be an external potential V. As well as a, a pairwise interaction W. So I will, so I, I am deciding that the particles only interact by pairs. I mean, I could also insert three body forces, four body forces, but I'm not going to do that. So, as uh, all of you know, I suppose, so this system is uh, just a Hamiltonian system. On uh, what's called the phase space, Rd, uh, so, well, I guess I want to do Rd, Rd to the n. Okay, so the variables are called xi uh, pi, where xi is just the position of the ith variable and pi the momentum. So m times the velocity, that's the momentum. And as a Hamiltonian system, there, there's an energy, which is uh, the following. So it's a function of x1, p1, x1, and so forth, xn, pn which is the kinetic energy. The potential energy and then the interaction with W. OK, I'm always summing over pairs. And so I will assume that W is an even function. I will not write it. I will always assume W is even. OK? So it means that the dynamics is just given by uh, Newton's equations. Okay, so just uh, xj dot uh, is uh, the derivative of the energy with respect to uh, pj. So you get pj divided by m. And pj dot is minus the grad of xj of v. Okay, so you have lots of coupled uh, ODEs. And the energy is, of course, conserved. Very good. What are the questions we want to look at? So 
we want to look at uh, stationary states. So stationary states are just states which uh, do not move. Okay. So uh, not moving means that pj uh, has to be zero, as you can see from the equation, and the gradient of e has to be zero. Okay. So they all have pj is uh, zero, and they are a critical point of the energy with respect to the x size. Also with respect to the pj's, but the, the only critical point is zero. Uh, this, so the ground state ground state is just uh, I mean the most stable uh, stationary state, so it's just a minimum if it exists uh, of e y or just because when you have you are at uh, say a strict local minimum non degenerate then locally uh, the level sets of E, they really look like, uh, I mean, you know, ellipsoids, and so it's very stable. And then there are uh, Gibbs states. So Gibbs states are a little bit more complicated because they are probabilistic. So you do not specify exactly where are the particles and what are their velocities, but just give a probability uh, for these guys. And so, so it's a probability measure on uh, the phase space, which, uh, which, which is of the following form, E minus beta E with the normalization factor in front Z. Okay, so it's, ju it's just an, an L1 function usually. Of course, you need assumptions to make sure that uh, you can integrate over the whole space and get uh, a probability measure. Very good. So what is it we want to do? We want to look at uh, the limit n to infinity and uh, understand what's happening. Uh, you have to think that w is given to you. And I mean, for, for some specific physical systems, you can sometimes tune w a little bit. But usually the interaction is a property of uh, the particles you look at. So if you look at some atoms, whatever, but usually there's not, I mean, if you look at, I don't know, two uh, at uh, hydrogen atoms, there's no real W because the hydrogen atom is not, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's not a fundamental particle. It's made of electron, an electron and a proton. So W is more empirical, okay? So, uh, I mean, W is given to you more or less uh, and uh, V is the one you tune in your lab, right? So V is the external potential, that's the one you modify. And so when you look at n to infinity, you have to make sure you choose V such that the limit will exist and uh, these infinitely many particles will be able to live together. Okay, but this is done through the use of V. So, so uh, what's the typical form of uh, W? that uh, you may want to consider. So, I mean, perhaps you look at electrons, and in this case, uh, W is just 1 over x, that's uh, Coulomb in 3D. Maybe you work in other dimensions, I don't know. Maybe you only consider uh, the gravitation force, and then it's just minus 1 over x, which is usually more unstable, more difficult. Uh, but otherwise, if you look at uh, atoms, uh, so typically, the form of W is that it's very repulsive at the origin, okay? And then at infinity, I mean, it's usually uh, like that, okay? So if your atoms cannot polarize or anything, the, you will have a van der Waals at infinity, meaning that it will behave like 1 over x to the 6 at infinity, okay? But if your atoms can become polarized, and I mean, you can have a different, you can have a 1 over x cubed, for instance. And the hard core is usu will usually uh, stabilize the system and compensate the attraction at infinity and make so that uh, these infinitely many particles can live together. Okay. Uh, typical uh, V that we will consider in this lecture, well, I mean, so I will use the, 
So when I want to confine the system to a finite domain, I will just take v to be infinite outside of the domain. I mean, it's a little bit uh, abuse of uh, notation. I think it's OK. So uh, I can take v to be uh, plus infinity in the complement of omega and 0 in omega. And then this will just mean that the system is confined to omega. OK? So that's a typical uh, situation we will consider. I mean, otherwise, you have uh, confining potentials. So what is a confining potential? It's a potential which goes to infinity at infinity. So for instance, uh, x squared, the harmonic potential. Or you could have uh, what I like to call uh, locally confining. On So for me, a locally confining potential is just a potential which is negative somewhere to attract the particle to some place. Okay? But then it goes to zero at infinity. So at infinity, the particles are completely free. Okay? So these are the kinds of potentials which we will consider in the lecture, in the quantum case. So far, I am classical. But so there was a large scale limit uh, for quantum gases in the title. So wh wh what would be one uh, typical slash important limit? It's uh, the thermodynamic limit. So thermodynamic limit is uh, trying to, uh, to construct an infinite gas living at the macroscopic scale, meaning our scale. Okay? So what is a thermodynamic limit? So you, you take a domain, omega, okay? and then you put, so now V is going to be uh, this V here. Okay? And I will take a, a very huge domain, which I'm increasing so as to cover the, the whole space. So I will take omega L, and the way I can do it is just by scaling a fixed omega, for instance. Let me assume omega as volume 1, and I scale it. And what I do is I put my n particles in omega. So I can, I mean, can look at the ground state, or maybe the Gibbs state at a given temperature. Oh, I forgot to say that the T is 1 over beta. OK? And then I'm trying to make so that some other my infinite gas should be finite locally. That's what I want. So what I will do is to fix the density rho, which is just n over the volume, so n over L to the d fixed. So that's a typical large scale limit when I try to construct an infinite system. Like your glass of water, if you, if you want, is, is of this kind. It has lots and lots of particles, 10 to the 23. And uh, at the microscopic level, one can describe them by uh, something, uh, a model of this sort. And then that's the, the typical large scale limit which one would like to do. Okay? Um, it's a very difficult limit. I mean, so there are many, many results on this limit. I'm not going to, to describe them now. But of course, the, the main goal is to understand what's happening with regard to uh, phase transitions. OK, so if you put temperature, then you expect that depending on the values of rho and t, sometimes you will get a solid, sometimes you will get a liquid, sometimes you will get a gas, and so on and so forth. So you expect to have phase transitions. Very good. Uh, this is not going to be uh, discussed today. But maybe uh, I should mention that uh, I mean you, you have to find a way of describing this infinite gas. So you can do it either via point processes, or you can also use correlation functions. which appeared yesterday already in Laura's uh, lecture. So correlation functions are just involving only finitely many particles at a time. So 
that you can expect that they are finite in your limit. Okay? And uh, today we will spend quite a bit of time on the quantum equivalent of correlation functions, which are density matrices, and uh, that's why I'm mentioning them now. But I think it's time to turn to the quantum case now. So let's discuss the quantum case. Very good. So in the quantum case, you know that there is a Heisenberg uh, principle. which tells you that you, you can't know uh, position and velocities uh, at an arbitrary uh, precision. So if you like, uh, if you think, uh, in, in the, I mean, using probabilities, uh, then uh, you have to have constraints between the probability for the momenta and the probability for the positions. Okay? So if I'm looking at the probability I get for the positions, the one I get for the momenta, then they can't be both equal to a delta, if you like. Uh, so there, are, there has to be constraints. And the constraint is the wave function, psi. And this psi is used as a constraint to, make, to, to ensure that uh, positions and velocities uh, cannot simultaneously be known to an arbitrary precision. How is that done? Well, it's done in the following way. Uh, you decide, so that's uh, the axiom, if you like, that, sorry, so psi is a function in L2 of Rd uh, n, which is normalized. Okay? So it's a function of n variables, each variable living in uh, Rd. And uh, the, the postulate is that psi of x1 xn squared is uh, the probability density uh, to observe uh, the first particle at x1, the second at x2, and so on. Okay? And then, if you take the Fourier transform of psi, take the square, then this is by definition the probability that the first particle has momentum P1, and so on and so forth. I'm working here with h bar equal to 1, for those who know what h bar is. And I'm also using a, a Fourier transform, which is an isometry, right? because I need this guy to be a probability measure if this one is a probability measure, so uh, you have to put the correct two pi's. Okay, so that's it. That's the only thing you have to know about quantum mechanics with these axioms, and then you can just uh, go on and understand everything what's happening. So uh, we can then compute the energy. So now you see the state of the system is no more a point in R2dn. Now it's a function in L2 of Rdn. Okay, so we went from finite dimension to infinite dimensions. And uh, psi is now the state of our system. And you see that psi is really the link between the probability for the momenta and the probability for the velocities. So that's, if you like, the Heisenberg principle. So the energy of, uh, of the system in the state uh, psi Well, I mean, uh, it's just the classical energy integrated against uh, the corresponding probabilities, right? So E of Psi is just the integral, the sum of Pj squared over 2 integrated against Psi hat squared plus the integral of the sum of V of Xj against the probability that the particles are at these xj's, and then the same for w. Psi squared. 
No, I mean, so let, let me remind you that uh, p j psi hat is actually the Fourier transform of minus i gradient x j of psi. So, and then if you use a Parseval, you deduce. Uh, I mean, you get the Dirichlet energy. Gradient psi squared over two. Oh, there was a name which I've uh, forgotten. Plus, and then the rest is unchanged. So, for the same reason that classical mechanics, the energy is linear with respect to the prob probability measure on phase space, here it's also. Well, it's not quite linear, but uh, it's uh, linear in probability measures, and you get a quadratic function in psi. So this you can write as a psi h n psi. Right? So it's a quadratic form if you integrate by parts, where h n is now the quantum Hamiltonian. Maybe I write it here, which is minus the sum j one to n minus. Oops. Laplace xj over 2, v of xj plus the sum w of xj minus xk. Okay, so you see, and I again forgot the m. I will soon take m equal 1 because. Uh, so you see that uh, your energy, which was a function on your phase space, is now an operator, right? So this guy is a, a self-adjoint. To make sure it's self-adjoint, one has to add lots of assumptions, but it's going to be self-adjoint on L2 of RDA. Okay, so this operator becomes the main object of interest when you want to study uh, the large n limit of quantum systems. I mean, so the people working in quantum theory know that uh, I forgot something, but the other ones, did you, did you notice that uh, there was something strange in what I wrote somewhere here? After all, it's a lecture, no? so you have to participate. <laughs> what you see when I say, uh, the probability that the first particle is at x1, the second is at x2, and so on. I'm really, uh, I decide that uh, I can know who is uh, who. I mean, so if I see somebody as, oh, you are the first, and then if I s look at the system at a later time, I, s I can say, oh, you were, uh, I know you, you were the first before. Okay? So, but I, this, they are all identical. So if I see the system at time one and the same at time two, I will never be able to know who has gone where, right? Because they are all the same. Okay, so everything should be invariant under permutations of uh, indices of labels. If I put labels on my particles, then it should it should not matter where I mean uh, who I decide is the first who and who is the second. So my model must be invariant under permutations, meaning that these two probabilities have to be invariant completely invariant under permutation, so meaning symmetric. Okay, so they have to be symmetric both. But I work on Psi. Okay, so I have to put now a constraint on Psi to make sure that this is symmetric. And quantum mechanics is a linear theory, I have to work in a linear space. Okay, so I have to find a linear subspace of L2 of RDN, for which I'm sure that for all everybody in this linear subspace, these two probabilities are symmetric. And if you do the little exercise, you will see there are only two possibilities when it's formulated this way. So either psi itself is symmetric or psi is anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric is just that you get a minus like a determinant when you flip uh, the labels. And of course, when you take the square, then the minus disappears. Okay, so uh, uh, it has to be
we will never study this Hamiltonian over the whole space L2 of Rdn, but we have to study to a subspace, or actually two subspaces, to uh, the subspaces of, so either are symmetric functions, meaning that uh, psi of, uh, if I exchange the labels, then it's completely invariant, and or anti-symmetric functions, meaning that when I exchange the labels, I get a minus. I mean, I get the signature of the permutation and this sign disappears when I take the square. So the first kind, uh, these are particles which are called bosons. The second kind are called fermions. And I will denote the corresponding subspace as L2S of Rdn. Now you see I have to be a little bit more careful. Before I was writing Rdn, right? but now I mean I'm not exchanging uh, the the I mean the the, co the the coordinates inside xj. I mean, okay, so I'm taking this uh, this kind of uh, xj, which itself has d variables, and I'm exchanging these d variables. So uh, that's why now I write Rd to the n with a little s. I hope it's clear enough. And for fermions, I'm going to write a. So this uh, symmetry constraint looks very innocent. But it's not innocent at all. And bosons and fermions typically behave very differently in some regimes. And this is something I will try to describe in the lecture. So you have to imagine that uh, fermions are m typically more stable than bosons because they hate each other. And bosons are extremely social. They love each other too much, which sometimes can lead to some kind of concentration and therefore instabilities. But proving this it is not always easy, and people have been working on this question for many years. So how do you see? So now I have to erase for the first time. Where is the? Hmm? Ah, it's hidden here. Oh. Ah, here. Maybe I keep this. What did I want to do? I don't know. Let's skip that. So what is a typical, uh, well, not typical, but I should not write typical. But how do I see that bosons uh, love each other so much? Well, I can actually put them all in the same state, make sure that they all do the same thing by taking a tensor product, meaning that's the equivalent of IID, if you like. So tensor product are just IID quantum particles. So if I take psi of x1, xn to be u of x1, u of xn, which is going to be denoted by u tensor n over x1, xn, where u is now a function of L2 of Rd, integral u squared equal to 1 then I for sure build a symmetric function. Okay? This we can call a Bose-Einstein condensate. I mean, it's extremely condensated, I mean, because they are all, exactly all of them, in the same state U. Okay, so that's a typical, uh, uh, not typical, but that's one simple example of a symmetric function. So if I want to do the same for, for an anti-symmetric function, then of course I can't, right, because, because it's symmetric, so it can't be anti-symmetric. So the simplest, simplest anti-symmetric function is uh, what's called a Slater determinant. So what is it? I just take a tensor product, 
Okay, and then I make it anti-symmetric by just summing with the proper sign over all uh, permutations. Okay? But then, I mean, remember, it has to be normalized, so it's a little bit uh, pain. And of course, my n functions, they have to be all different, because if, if two are equal, then I get zero when I anti-symmetrize. Okay, so it's easier if you, uh, from the beginning, decide that they are orthonormal, which you can always do, by the way, by, by just uh, picking the right basis. So let me take u1, un, which form an orthonormal, also normal system in L2 of Rd. Uh, then I can just take the tensor product and then I anti-symmetrize by uh, doing the sum of all permutations, sign, blah, blah, blah. And you see it's just a determinant. So that's why it's called a determinant. So that's psi x1, xn, which is the determinant of ui xj. So you look at this matrix, ui xj. And then the proper uh, normalization is the square root of n factorial. Okay, so that's a typical, simple uh, fermionic function. Very good. So what is it we want to do with uh, our quantum system? Now well, we want to do the same as in the classical case. So first, uh, what is the dynamics? Well, it's also a Hamiltonian system. Can you just uh, explain why, uh, from this formula, you use that somehow the uh, fermionic system is more stable than the... Oh, you don't see it here, but you will see it when I will give you an example later. On this example, I mean... No, no, it's not clear at all. Right? I mean, what you see definitely is that uh, uh, two fermions can't be at the same place. Right? Okay, so they avoid each other a little bit because psi vanishes if two... Uh, xj's are equal, but uh, as such, this guy is not more stable than that. I have to study a specific system too. Okay, but uh, you will see in an example that uh, there will be a huge difference between the two. You will see later. Uh, very good. So uh, Hamiltonian system. So if you are not used to it, you may be worried because Hamiltonian system you need two variables and a symplectic. Uh, right? To have a Hamilton. Now it seems that we have only one psi. So you may be worried, but you but that's because I have not insisted on one thing that psi has to be complex valued. And that's very important. And when psi is complex valued, then you do have two variables, real part, imaginary part. And by the way, if you compute uh, the energy of uh, psi one plus i psi two is just equal to the energy of psi one plus the energy of psi two. So then when you just write your Hamiltonian system, well, let me write this, okay? So E of uh, Psi 1 plus I Psi 2, where these two are real, it's just E of Psi 1 plus E of Psi 2. That's because my Hamiltonian itself is real. You can just write the quadratic form. And so now I will just, uh, I mean, cross the derivatives the usual way for a Hamiltonian system. So I do Psi 1 dot is a, uh, uh, the grad with respect to psi 2 of uh, E and psi 2 dot is minus the grad with respect to psi 1 of E. I mean, that's the usual, usual symplectic form, okay? And then if you just write what this is, you will find I psi dot is uh, actually 2 H psi, which is uh, Schrodinger's equation. And by changing units of time, you can always remove the two. I mean, the two doesn't really matter. Okay, so that's Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so it's just a Hamiltonian system, but in infinite dimension. And now, So now we have to discuss what are stationary states, what is the ground state, and what are Gibbs states. And then we can start our study of the large n limits of these systems. So uh, what is a stationary state? So 
for a stationary state is just a state which doesn't move, except that here, you see, we have a model which has a certain invariance, right? Everything is uh, completely unchanged if I multiply psi by a phase, e to the i theta. Okay, so, so my model is completely phase invariant. So this, uh, if you like, u of 1 uh, acts uh, on my model, and I want to work modulo phase because they don't do anything to my probabilities, they don't do anything to the energy, they don't do anything. So we work modulo phases. And therefore, a stationary state is just something which doesn't move modulo phase. So if you like, it, it has a phase which moves. And then if you plug that in, into uh, the Schrodinger's equation, you will see that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, psi will be a just an ion function of h. Okay. You will get actually the derivative of the phase, but you can be an eigen function of only one eigenvalue at a time, so then the phase, oh, okay, let me do it. Okay. So you take psi of t is e minus i uh, theta of t, if you like, psi is zero, which doesn't move, so a phase which moves in time and something which only depends on x. Okay, and then when you plug in into uh, Schrodinger's equation, you get theta prime of t uh, psi 0 is h psi 0. Okay, so you deduce that psi 0 is an eigenfunction of h with eigenvalue theta prime of t, but I mean it can be uh, only one eigenvalue at a time. Okay, so you deduce that theta prime of t is constant. You call it lambda, and you see that you get h psi 0 is lambda psi 0, and then here, that, that was just t times lambda. So you have a phase which moves, but which doesn't do anything to the system. So uh, stationary states are just eigenfunctions of h, which, by the way, just correspond to uh, critical points of uh, the energy on, on the unit sphere of L2. Now, what is the ground state? Well, the ground state is uh, the, sm I mean the, the stationary states with the lowest possible energy. So it corresponds to taking lambda of the smallest possible, if you like, so the minimum of the spectrum of HN. First eigenvalue, if you like, if it exists. Otherwise, minimum of the spectrum. Okay, so the ground state energy, maybe I call it E of N, is just the minimum of the spectrum of H. Of course, remember that I have two such minima, one for bosons, one for fermions. They are not the same a priori. So that's the ground state energy, and then the ground state is the corresponding psi zero. And then Gibbs state, So a Gibbs state is, uh, so it's as usual a little bit more complicated than just uh, states because it's more a probability over states, right? So you want to go a little bit uh, further up in a sense. So it's going to be exponential minus uh, beta hn, z minus 1, which now, as you can see, is an operator on uh, L2 of Rdn. Okay, and what we normalize now is no more uh, the integral, there's no integral, but we normalize the trace. Okay, so z is the trace of exponential minus beta h. Okay, so maybe May I ask a question? Yes. So why is it necessarily true that the bottom of the spectrum is an eigenvalue? No, no, it's not necessary. So you don't necessarily have a ground state? So, so far, there, there, there was no assumption, right? So it's vague. So that will depend on V and W. Okay, so I, I can put assumptions to make sure that this is finite. And then, by the way, it will always be a minimum, right? So the spectrum is closed, so right, it will be a minimum. But there might not exist uh, an eigenfunction. Exactly. exactly, yes. That will depend on V, philosophically speaking, right? V has to really make sure the particles do not escape if you want to be sure that there is such an eigenfunction. If you take V equals zero, for instance, there, there cannot be an eigenfunction. 
But in the confined cases? In the confined cases, there will always be, yes. There will always be an idle function which is at the bottom of each. Yes, yes, if W is not too crazy, yes. Okay, so that's the Gibbs state. Okay, so the Gibbs state is a little bit more complicated because it's not a wave function, but it's a, it's a an operator acting on your, on your uh, Hilbert space. But I can always diagonalize it. Uh, I'm using the notation with the ket and the bra, so it's a self-adjoint operator. I can diagonalize it. Okay, it will have some uh, ni. This ni will just be e minus uh, beta lambda i divided by z, where lambda i's are the eigenvalues of h. I'm assuming now it's confined. I mean, for a Gibbs state, it has to be confined to make sure the trace is finite. Okay, so then I only have eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues have to go to infinity sufficiently fast to make sure that this sum converges. Okay, so lambda i's are the eigenvalues of, uh, of hn. And then the psi i's are uh, the stationary states. So you see it's more a mixture. It's called a mixed state, actually. So it's a mixture of, uh, of stationary states. And you have to think of it as a probability over stationary states with a certain weight ni, which is chosen in terms of the temperature beta. Very good. So now what we want to do is to uh, study the large n limit of uh, such systems. And of course, as, uh, as you know, I mean, um, uh, it's very hard to say anything precise at finite n, and it's even harder when n gets large. Okay, so there's no way, I mean, except for very simple uh, situation where it's all explicit, but there are not so many explicit situations. Usually there's no way of computing, even on a computer, it's extremely hard to get a good approximation on the ground state energy, on the corresponding eigenfunction, or on the corresponding Gibbs state. It's a very hard question because Schrodinger's equation is a PDE in RDN. Okay, so it's huge dimension and uh, there's just no way one can easily uh, do uh, things at a sufficiently high precision. Anyway, so when looking at the limit n to infinity, uh, we will not be able to work with psi anymore because psi will become a function of infinitely many variables. It's not fun. So as usual, we will look at correlation functions, which in the case, in the quantum case, are called density matrices. So that's what I would like to discuss now, after this long introduction, properties of density matrices. Okay, so which are the quantum equivalent of correlation functions. So what is a density matrix? Uh, I will define them uh, for, for a pure state, so for a psi. But then when you have a mixed state, you just uh, get the same definition by linearity. Okay, so let me take a state psi. So you know the correlation functions. When I have a probability measure, I just integrate all variables but k. And then I put uh, n, uh, n choose k, or not, depending on your choice, but I do. And, uh, and then uh, I mean, uh, you get something which describes events involving k particles at a time. So here we do the same, except that we have more freedom because we are not working with a probability measure. We work with psi, which is a little bit the square root of a probability measure. So uh, gamma k psi, so that's the k particle density matrix. It's called density matrix uh, because that's the name used in physics, but it's not a matrix, it's an operator. Right? So it's an infinite matrix, if you like. So wha wha what is it? So that's a, no a self-adjoint operator on L2 of Rd k. Okay. k is the number of particles which I retain, which is defined this way. So depending on your taste, I will write two equivalent definitions.
So this guy is actually n choose k. And then I do the partial trace of the orthogonal projection onto psi. So that's the more algebraic definition, if you like, partial trace. So I integrate n minus k variables. But if you don't like that, that's also the operator whose integral kernel is gamma k psi. So I have to be careful. So I have lots of variables, y1, yk. Okay, so I'm giving you an, integ an integral kernel, the integral kernel of an operator of L2 of Rd to the power k is n choose k and psi of x1 ta 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 xk and zk plus 1 ta 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 zn psi of y1 ta 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 yk and then the same zk plus 1 z bar d zk plus 1 d z n. So it's exactly the same as a correlation function. I do integrate n minus k variables, except that the first k, I use the fact that I have a square root, so I can put two kinds of particles, two kinds of variables, the x's and the y's. This is how I get an operator instead of a function. Note that if you take all the x's equal to the y's, then you do get exactly the correlation function, the classical correlation function. Okay, so gamma k psi of x1 ta 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 and x1 ta 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 is the k particle uh, correlation function. Well, depending of your convention, whether you put an I mean, some people don't put anything. Some people put an n factorial over n minus k factorial, and some put the k factorial. Uh, I think the n choose k is the one compatible with the uh, uh, Fox spaces. That's the one I like the, the most. Uh, these correlation functions you've seen yesterday right, in uh, Lars' lecture. So what's nice with the operator is that it contains everything. So if I look at the operator and I take its Fourier transform, so what do I mean by Fourier transform? I mean I conjugate by Fourier on both sides, right? So I pass to Fourier variables. And then when I do P1, P, uh, PK, and then I take the same P1, PK, I get the correlation functions for the momenta. So you see that the density matrix, so this operator, contains uh, both the correlation function in position and the correlation function in velocities. So, I mean, as is uh, usual, I mean, one can express uh, terms in the energy using only gamma 2. Or gamma 1 for the one particle part and gamma 2 for the two particle part. So, for instance, if you compute this one particle part of the energy, okay, psi is either symmetric or anti-symmetric, so this is just actually n times uh, the same operator acting only in the first variable. And then this n is exactly the n uh, choose 1. So you, you see that you can also write this in a funny uh, way, that it's minus Laplace plus v applied to gamma 1, everything in L2 of Rd. Okay, so each time you have a, something which only involves one particle at a time, you can express it using the one particle density matrix. And for the same reason, you can also express it using the two particle density matrix, if you like. But for the same reason, if you look at the interaction, then uh, it is exactly the gamma 2. 
over L2 of Rd squared AOS. Okay? So something very natural would be to say, oh, let's forget all this psi and all. It's too complicated, let's only work with gamma 2. Well, that would be wonderful. Okay, so uh, problem, uh, the set of gamma 2s coming from a psi is very complicated. and not known. Hmm. However, if one could use only gamma 2, that would be uh, fantastic. In physics, it's usually called uh, Colson's challenge. So at a conference, Colson was uh, apparently the first or one of the first saying we have to find a way of using only gamma 2 and maybe even if we can't know exactly what's the set of gamma 2s, we could find maybe sufficient conditions or necessary conditions and do approximations this way directly on the two particle density matrix, but it's not so easy. Okay. okay. Uh, yes? A um, question. I mean, to what extent is this used by chemists? I mean, I mean, I mean that the gamma 2, you mean? Yeah, I mean, you make guesses for the set which are, you know, yeah, so around, around 2000, I don't know, 2005 or something like that. So there was, a, uh, I mean, s some kind of uh, uh, excitement by chemists. And there was a group of, uh, of chemists who uh, did some calculations. So w one can define the set of gamma 2s by uh, writing, uh, actually, uh, infinitely many linear constraints. And... Uh, so they were able to do some numerics and tested only the five first constraints and got the best results so far uh, for the ground state energy of some atoms. So there was some excitement, but still it was extremely uh, costly on the computational side. So there is a group of chemists really working on uh, putting some constraints on gamma 2. Okay. Removing all the other ones. I can find the names and give them to you now. They, they don't uh, come to my mind. But, uh, ask me again. I will send you the references. I think they are in Japan. I'm not sure. Anyway, it's a natural question, and people have worked on this problem. We also worked a little bit on this problem. But uh, still, it's, it's not, so, not so easy. Uh, I have to state a lemma for you. The properties of this gamma k. Okay, so I gave you the definition here. So uh, gamma k. So for any psi, gamma k is a non-negative self-adjoint operator, and it's actually trace class. It has a trace. Then it's also Hilbert-Schmidt, and it has a kernel, so it's good. Uh, I mean, this kernel definitely makes sense in L2, which you can prove by cauchy schwarz uh, So this guy has a finite trace, which, of course, I mean, the trace is the same as integrating the diagonal of the kernel. So you get n choose k. Okay, so, so the trace is huge. It blows up with n, but I mean, it's like in classical mechanics, the integral is huge, but it's not. We know it's going to be huge. What we want to have is something which is locally finite, but not uh, finite everywhere. So from this, we conclude immediately that the operator norm of gamma k is less than n choose k. Right? If the trace, uh, if the sum of the eigenvalues is equal to n choose k, uh, then the largest eigenvalue is also less than n choose k. And one natural question is to ask, is that optimal? Is this bound optimal? Is that true that I can have an eigenvalue of order uh, n choose n choose k is like n to the power k, right, for large n? Is that true that I can always have such an eigenvalue? And there you already see a difference between bosons and fermions. So 
let me start with bosons. Bosons, that's quite easy, but still. So is n choose k optimal. So I'm asking optimal as a bound on the norm, right? Or, or, or on, the, on the largest eigenvalue, if you like. So bosons, yes. And that's quite easy, because if I take Psi to be a Bose-Einstein condensate, uh, where full, I don't know how complete, I don't know how to call it, because they are all of them exactly in the state U. That's really a big condensate. Then I can compute everything easily now, because this, when I integrate over some variables, I just remove some of the U's. And you will find immediately that the gamma K of U tensor N is just n choose k times the projection on u tensor k. So it is a rank one operator. So when I take a Bose-Einstein condensate, then I have just one eigenvalue, which is the largest it can be. Now you can do a little exercise and show it's the only way that you can have an eigenvalue of uh, equal to n choose k. Right? Well, if there is only one eigenvalue, then it has to be a tensor product. But uh, one can as actually ask more. I mean, if we have eigenvalues of order n choose k, so uh, namely of order n to the power k, is that, I mean, do they have to come from a condensate, or can I get something more complicated? Okay, so, so this really uh, goes back to uh, Penrose and Onzager in 50, what, 50, I don't know, 56. And they said, let's actually define Bose-Einstein condensation by the property that gamma, I mean, we look at a certain system at an equi equilibrium or maybe a Gibbs state or something, then we compute the corresponding uh, density matrices. Then we say that there is the einstein condensation when uh, gamma k has an eigenvalue of order. And then, of course, we look at the limit n to infinity. Right, so it's of order n to the k. I mean, n choose k is just n to the k divided by k factorial, right? so for large n. So they define Bose-Einstein condensation as the k particle density matrices have an eigenvalue of order n choose k. So you have to imagine that in a normal system, so in your glass of water, for instance, uh, gamma k is usually more of order 1. Right? I mean, its trace is infinite because n is infinite or almost infinite. But uh, as an operator, it's usually bounded. We will see examples later. Okay? So Bose-Einstein condensation is something exceptional which is happening here. It's a kind of phase transition where suddenly lots of particles, so a macroscopic number of particles, occupy the same state. And... Uh, give an eigenvalue of order n to the k. And because of this example, Penrose and Onzager decided that this is how we are going to define uh, Bose-Einstein condensation. Now you should protest. Is that the only case or not? Let me understand that. Yeah, okay. good that you are protesting. <laughs> so the natural question is to ask, well, if, I mean, if uh, the k particle density matrix, matrix uh, has something of order n to the k, does it come from something like that, or can I get something different? It's a very delicate question, but there is an answer to this question, which is essentially uh, yes. The only possibilities are uh, the U tensor case. And that's a uh, theorem, which is uh, usually called uh, quantum definity.
which says the following. Okay, so let me consider, and I it's it's an abstract theorem which is actually valid over a general Hilbert space, blah blah blah. But I'm just staying in my uh, setting of L2 of R D. Okay, so you take psi n a sequence. any sequence huh, of bosonic uh, states. Bosonic, huh? we are discussing bosons. And let me assume, so let me look at what is uh, at scale n to the k. Uh -huh. Welcome <laughs> to Zoom. Please press pound, then enter your meeting ID Followed oh. by the pound sign again. That's because I forgot to do a break. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me start all over again. So let me take any sequence of bosonic states. And I, I am still working on uh, L2S of RD. I mean, it's actually abstract, but I, I don't have to make it abstract. I mean, any sequence of bosonic states. And then what I will do is I will assume that there is something at scale n to the k. Okay? I mean, I have to put some, some, some kind of more assumptions than just an eigenvalue, right? Because an eigenvalue is not sufficient. The eigenfunction could do crazy things, go weakly to zero. So I will assume that I, have a, I do have an eigenvalue, but that the corresponding eigenfunctions behave well. So they have a non-zero weak limit. Okay, so I will assume that the corresponding n pa k particle length T matrix divided by n choose k has a weak limit to something, which I call gamma k. And this weak limit is a weak in trace class. So if you like, I'm looking at what I have at scale n to the power k. And let me notice that this guy has trace 1 for all k. So actually, after extracting a subsequence by uh, Banara Oglu, I can always assume that this limit is correct. So if you start with any sequence psi n, you can always extract a subsequence for which you have uh, that. Okay, so it's not, it's not a big deal to assume it converges. Okay. In most cases, it will converge, but you will get zero. If you look at your glass of water, you will get zero because there's nothing at scale n to the k. Okay, then the theorem will be empty, but still true. Recording okay? in progress. However, what the theorem will tell you is that if there is something at scale n to the k, then it has to be of that form. So it, it has to be a condensate. Uh, then there exists a probability measure P on the unit ball of L2 of RD invariant under phases such that this gamma case are all an average u tensor k, u tensor k, dp of u. Okay, so the theorem is saying uh, if you do have something, if something converges at scale n to the k, then it has to be a convex combination of what you would get for an exact Boser-Einstein condensate. So if you like, it has to be a convex combination of condensates. Sorry, but <coughs> would you guess yes. there has been a crash for like 10 minutes? Okay. A very, very quick recap of the last 10 minutes. Okay, what did I do? When when was 10? Okay, so maybe here. Mm, I think density matrix, matrices and then from there or oh. the upper. Up there, okay. So let me summarize. So I have defined the K particle density matrix of any N particle state bosons and fermions, and that's a self-adjoint operator, which is non-negative, meaning uh, its eigenvalues are non-negative. And the trace, uh, which is the sum of the eigenvalues, is n choose k, 
by definition, from which I deduce that the norm, namely the largest eigenvalue, is at most n choose k. Okay? So that's what I, what I have uh, proved. Uh, there's no proof. It's essentially from the, from the definition. Then I asked, so now I look at large n fixed k. k is going to be anything but fixed, and n is going to be large. That's the large scale limit, large n limit. And I ask, can I, can I get this, an eigenvalue of this order n to the power k? And for bosons, so I ask, is this n choose k, which is like n to the power k, is that optimal? For bosons, that's clear it is, because if I take a Bose-Einstein condensate, and I compute gamma k because it's a tensor product, everything simplifies. And I find that gamma k is a rank 1 operator, which is n choose k, times the rank 1 orthogonal projection on u tensor k. So I have an eigenvalue of order n choose k, it's even equal. And all the other ones are 0. Now the natural, so then Penrose and Onzager in the 56, they decided to define Bose-Einstein condensation from the property that uh, gamma k psi n has an eigenvalue of order n choose k. And the natural question is, all right, but uh, if I really get something at this scale n choose k, are they condensates? Okay. And uh, the answer is yes. If uh, you allow me to use weak limits, I mean, it's, it's, it's not the only way to answer the question, but if you allow me to use weak limits, the answer is yes. So you take any sequence of bon bosonic states. You, up to subsequences, you can always assume, if you like, uh, that gamma k divided by n choose k has a weak limit. Okay, and it's actually weakly star in the trace class. Let me remind you that this means that you test against compact operators. Okay. And let me call this limit gamma k. The theorem says, then, there exists a probability measure uh, p on the unit ball. Well, it's the unit ball because you can lose something when you do weak limits. Not the unit sphere, the unit ball of L2 of Rd. Uh, so that the gamma k's are given by this formula. They are all given by the same p. That's very important. So there is one p which works for all k. and which tells me that gamma k is an average of what I would get from this example, so if you like, of condensates. Okay, so if I look at weak limits, then at the scale n to the power k for bosons, I can only see condensates. Actually, you see, it's not pure condensates. I can have a mixture of condensates, like one half one guy plus one half another guy, because of p which you would uh, typically do by, uh, instead of doing u tensor n, you can do u tensor n over 2, tensor v uh, n over 2, or something like that, okay? And then you have uh, two condensates, uh, uh, you take v orthogonal to u, and then, uh, I mean, so it's clear that you can have such a p. Right? They, they don't ha have to be all exactly in the same condensate, you can have a mixture of several ones. Yes? <coughs> if there is some loss and uh, the measure is not on the sphere, is there some interpretation of this, uh, this loss? Well, I mean, again, I mean, in your glass of water, there's nothing of order n to the k, and then it will always go to zero. Okay? So the, the loss uh, can contain uh, everything else, like uh, your thermodynamic uh, system or Jacob. Yeah, this uh, definition of Penrose and Jansager uh, is, so to say, more uh, restrictive than uh, what is usually uh, done, than one uh, looks just at k equal to 1, and mm -hmm. uh, it looks True. just at the one particle, the density matrix. True. Yeah, that's a good remark. So let me emphasize that um, uh, if the limit, I mean, if when you, so the theorem is always true, okay. but. Uh, if the limit is non-zero for one k, then it's non-zero for all k. Okay, so you can also just restrict yourself to gamma one if you like. Okay, so the because up to subsequences you can always assume they all converge, and then you get this guy. Okay, 
And then uh, when you compute, I mean, you see when you compute uh, the gamma one, so the weak limit of the gamma of the one particle density matrix, you see, uh, I mean, for instance, if you get the trace, you want to know if it's non-zero or not, you get the trace, just a matter of whether P is uh, zero or not. It's a delta at zero or not. Okay, and either P is a delta at zero and then you have nothing, or P is not a delta at zero and then you have non-zero for all K. Yes? So if, you, if it goes to zero and you normalize differently, is anything known then? So if you, if you normalize by a sequence, so you get a non-trivial limit, uh, you're talking about the n truth okay. k. So this is your chosen normalization. Exactly. So here it's very important that I'm looking at the largest possible eigenvalue. So I have to divide by n to the power k. So you may well have eigenvalues which diverge but slower. And then I can't say anything. Andreas. Um, does it also work for mixed states? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. You and it's two and the same. No, no, it's all the same for mixed states. Yes, yes. I'm, I mean, I know people usually don't like mixed states very much, but uh, so let me write same for mixed states. Sorry. So it works for a Gibbs state or anything. Okay. A little bit of history. So. Oh, that's what I wanted to keep. What is a mixed state? Oh, so mixed state, yes. Okay, so, so, so when I have a general gamma, which is a sum of ni psi i psi i, okay, with ni non-negative sum ni is one, like my Gibbs state, for instance, was such an example. Okay. So that's what I call the mixed state, which you should always think as a probability over uh, some set of, uh, of states psi i. Okay, and then by definition, the, the gamma k of this gamma okay, is by definition just a sum of the ni, the gamma of the psi i. Okay, it's just linear, so it's all linear. And then the same theorem uh, is true for bosons. So a little bit of uh, history. So, so the theorem is due to uh, Hudson Moody. So first, this theorem is a quantum version of something you may have uh, encountered already. So the Definiti or Hewitt Savage theorem in in the classical case, but it's for, for operators, if you like, for non-commuting uh, uh, things. It's been proved by Hudson Moody in 76 uh, and Sturmer in 69. Uh, but that was in the case that there is a strong convergence. Okay, so it's the same theorem, but you assume strong convergence, not weak. Strong convergence, you can't always assume, right? Even going to a subsequent, it's not clear yeah, that you will have strong convergence. But if you do assume strong convergence, uh, then you get the same theorem. And in this case, P is su uh, supported, I mean, concentrates on the unit sphere instead of the unit ball. And that's actually equivalent. You have strong convergence if and only if P concentrates on the unit sphere. No loss of mass. OK? So they had the same theorem, except here it was strong, so that was a true assumption. And uh, P was on the unit sphere. And this is very similar to the classical theorem classical in the sense of uh, classical mechanics huh? of uh, Definiti in the 30s and uh, Hewitt Savage in the 50s. So the version with a weak convergence is uh, in our paper with Nam and Nicolas Rougerie in 2014. And actually, uh, there was uh, something very similar, although not stated that way, in works by Amari and Nier. Around 08. 
there are several papers. Okay, so what's nice is that it really tells you that uh, having an eigenvalue of order n to the k is really Bose-Einstein condensation. It's something which is not normal, I mean, something exceptional, which is, uh, of course, very specific of bosons. This is very abstract. It doesn't really tell you uh, whether this will happen or not. So, in the, I mean, later in, in the lecture, I will give you examples where you do get a non trivial P. And may, may, may I? Yes? So, can you see here when you give some spatial structure to it, long range order from this type of, in, in the condensate? Um, I mean, can you see long range order? I mean, so what they call this off diagonal? Off diagonal long range order, yes. Um, this is an abstract theorem. It's true in L any Hilbert space. Abstract indeed on. Yes, yes. So here I stated it on L2 of RD just because I didn't want to work in an abstract Hilbert space, but it is an abstract theorem. Doesn't use anything, so it, there, there's no space really. Yeah, but, but if you take it. But if you apply it. Yeah, if you apply it to a specific model, then uh, they will usually uh, happen together, yes. Happen together or from this formulation you can derive the uh, uh, This I don't know. I never really thought about it. Yakov. Uh. Well, that's, of course, limited to uh, the concept of uh, rock diagonal. Uh, Long and short is usually limited to translationally invariant limit. Yeah, true. So, uh, yeah, if you have a trapped gas, more general. <coughs> yeah, so it is more general. Uh, maybe a remark. So this theorem is a compactness theorem. So you may not like it in a way because. It it's not very quantitative. It doesn't tell you whether you are close to being a condensate or not. You have to pass to the limit. And, uh, okay, so it's, it is a kind of compactness theorem. <coughs> or it's more a structure. So you first pass to weak limits, and then you express wha what's the structure of the possible weak limits. But, uh, but it's a bit vague. It doesn't really tell you whether you have to take an extremely large or uh, whether, I mean, okay. Uh, so, so there is actually a, quanti a quantitative version, but uh, this theorem can be quantitative only in finite dimension. Okay, so uh, there exists a quantitative version, but in finite dimension. Okay, so you assume, I don't know, uh, everything lives over a finite uh, dimensional subspace of uh, L2. And it's of the following that uh, for any psi, there exists uh, Pn, okay, uh, such that when you look at the gamma k psi n minus the average d Pn of u, uh, oh sorry, I have to divide by gamma n k, then you look at the trace norm. So you, you take the trace of the absolute value, then this is less than 4k d over n. Okay, so if you work in finite dimension, then actually you have an error of the order 1 over n, or k over n, which is not so bad. No? Of course, the dimension enters. So if you study a specific situation, you are never in finite dimension. But we use this theorem many times to get uh, quantitative estimates, the idea being to say, for instance, if you are in a trap, you will uh, essentially occupy finitely many modes. And you can use these estimates. And then you have to know that the, 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 the high energy modes are, have to be uh, only a little bit occupied because they, they, they cost too much. OK, so one can get quantitative estimates in infinite dimension by reducing to finite dimensions and using this result here. 
the PN is explicit. I'm not going to, to give it to you, but that's a, a result which is due to a Christendel Koenig Nietzsche and Renner. And uh, we also have a different proof of the same result. Excuse me, the yes. D here is not the D uh, as before. Oh, no, okay, let me call it, let me call it, uh, oh no, capital uh, the D. The dimension of the functional space. Of the function, yes. Okay, so L2 of Rd is replaced by uh, a space of dimension capital D. Thank you. So some words about fermions before we go on. So fermions, the answer is no. And there you see immediately uh, an effect of the anti-symmetry. Okay, so fermions can, I mean, the density matrices cannot, can never have an eigenvalue of order n to the k. So there is a, a theorem by Yang, 63, which says that the norm of gamma k so meaning the largest possible eigenvalue of a psi n okay, is less than a universal constant ck, and then it's n to the k over 2. Okay, so if k is 1, it's n to the power 0, so then gamma is bounded. If k is 2, then you get n. If k is 3, you get n. If k is 4, you get n squared, and so on and so forth. for some universal CK unknown. I mean, we, we have some bounds on CK which are very bad. There is also a famous conjecture by Young himself about the value of this CK. But uh, I mean, no progress, to my knowledge, in, this, uh, in the direction of solving this conjecture. So you see that for fermions, you cannot have eigenvalues of order n to the power k, and it's more complicated. But it's very intuitive. That's because they hate each other, as we said. However, what fermions could do, perhaps, is to form pairs. Okay? And now if you think, think of a function of four variables, which is anti-symmetric, then, then if I put together the first two and put together the, the, the last two, when I exchange them, I do get a plus, because I get many minuses, they compensate. Okay, so pair of fermions behave a little bit like bosons. Okay, and uh, now you understand the theorem. So in a Psi n, the idea is that fermions, the best they can do is to form pairs. And then these pairs maybe can do something a little bit like condensation, not clear, but they, they can kind of love each other a little bit more. And that's the reason of the k to the 2 and the floor. Okay? Because if, n, if, k is if k is 2, then you can form one pair, and then you get n. Okay? But then if k is 4, you can form only two pairs, but two pairs condensating would give you an n. An, what did I say? Yeah, would give you an n squared because of the bosons. Okay? So that's the best which is known for fermions. Now you could say, well, oh, I mean, let's take this guy, divide by that, try to see uh, what's the limit, but nothing like a weak limit will work. So firm, the fermionic density matrices have very algebraic, uh, I mean, subtle uh, algebraic properties. So for instance, if you take, if you take a tensor product, uh, so let me take uh, u1, un, and the gamma k, psi n, v1, Vn, the scalar product. So what I'm doing here, oh sorry, so that's a Slater determinant, which I have defined. It's just uh, my uh, usual tensor product, which is then anti-symmetrized. Okay, and things like that uh, form a basis of our uh, n-particle space. So actually, if you look at that, then this is always less than one, as soon as u1, un is uh, orthonormal, 
and V1, Vn is orthonormal. So a different way of saying it is that if you work in finite dimension, uh, then the gamma k's are always bounded. Okay, so for fermions in finite dimensions, gamma k's are bounded. But the bound depends on the dimension. Psion bounded in finite dimension. It's very intuitive because if you are in finite dimension, when you have uh, fermions, you can never put more than the, than the dimension. So, anyway, you see fermions are much more complicated. And uh, so that's somehow already a hint uh, uh, that they may have a different behavior in some large scale limits. Is, is this pairing related to Cooper pairs? Or yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So that would be the Cooper pairs, which explain uh, superconductivity. Or yes. So uh, let's go to the last part of uh, today. So now the goal, of course, is to uh, give you some examples where you see Bose-Einstein condensation and so on and so forth. But I thought that, I mean, you, you will also have lots of talks, I mean, maybe not so many, but talks about the subject. So uh, for those who have never really seen, uh, I mean, or have seen, but have not uh, worked themselves with uh, quantum problems, I think you have to first see the, 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 the non-interacting case before you look at the interacting case. So I thought I would spend the, the last uh, half an hour telling you what's happening for a non-interacting quantum gas. I mean, it's already full of surprises, right? And not so easy. So, and I think you have to see that if you want to really understand uh, the interacting systems. Okay, so that's part four, uh, the free gases. And then on Thursday, I will uh, talk about interacting systems. So now we go back to uh, what's written there. Actually, I could use the same blackboard. Okay, so I'm taking a domain omega sub L, which is very large, and I'm going to uh, take a fixed domain and dilate it. Okay. I'm going to assume that zero is somewhere in the middle. Okay, make it big. And now I take uh, v so I take W equals zero, because that's non-interacting. And I take V to be infinite outside of omega. Which will just confine the system to omega. And actually what will happen, I mean now we have to talk about self-adjoint operators. So I have to tell you what is the boundary condition of the Laplacian. And in this case I will just get Dirichlet. Okay, so what we have to do is to study uh, Hn, which is the sum of minus Laplace and Xj, j equal 1 to n. I mean, sorry, I mean, you see, this guy is just the full Laplace in Rdn. The way I am writing it this way is because I have these symmetric or anti symmetric constraints. Okay? And maybe I put an L here to emphasize that this is the Dirichlet Laplace. Omega L. So this Dirichlet Laplacian by scaling, we know many things. So, so the, the eigenvalues of this Dirichlet Laplacian are just uh, the eigenvalues divided by L squared, where lambda i is uh, lambda i1, that is the, the Dirichlet eigenvalues. on omega, which is not scaled. I mean, the, the guy we start with. 
Okay, so when I increase L, then my spectrum becomes more and more dense. I have more and more eigenvalues, and then I converge to the spectrum of the Laplacian, which is the whole half line in the whole space. And of course, the corresponding eigenfunctions are the UIL of X, which is just UI of X over L, L to the D over 2. Very good. So now, what is the spectrum? of HN. It's a small exercise. And it's simple because it's a sum. Okay, So of course, I get a different answer depending on bosons and fermions. So how does that go? Well, the, the remark is that, of course, the ULI form a, a basis of uh, L2 of omega L. OK, of a normal basis. And uh, actually, so if I look at the UI1L tensor UINL, this form a basis of L2 of omega L to the power n. Right, so uh, UI1 of x1, and then xn. And then if I look at subspaces, I just have to uh, symmetrize or anti-symmetrize these spaces. OK, so u i1 l. I will write a v for the symmetric guys. OK, so this v is just uh, 1 over square root n factorial, the sum of all permutations of the tensor products. And you have to be a little bit careful that when, uh, uh, because of the sum, when uh, two are identical, then this guy is not normalized. It's, it's not fun. I mean, bosons. Uh, so, so they are not necessarily normalized. Because the definition of my tensor product is 1 over square root n factorial, and then the sum of all permutations. Fermions are better. I1L, then I put this wedge, which is really just the Slater determinant I defined before. And that's also a basis. So of course, for fermions, you're not allowed to repeat two guys. And uh, the order also counts, of course. I mean, uh, otherwise, you get the same function. So for fermions, you have to assume, for instance, i1, so they less than in. For bosons, you have more freedom because they can be repeated without problems. OK? And then when you apply hn to such a guy, I mean, HN is a sum, and uh, this guy is a tensor product. So when you apply HN, you just get the sum of the eigenvalues. Okay, so HN of a guy like that will always be the sum of the lambda IK Okay, so the spectrum of HN is just the sum of the eigenvalues. But with constraints on the indices, because for fermions, we can't repeat any eigenvalue. Okay. So uh, now we can compu compute the ground state energy. Okay, and now I will finally answer our last question. Sorry that it took so long. So for bosons, I mean what's the lowest this can be is when they are all equal to lambda one. OK, so the picture is the following. So here is the spectrum of your directly Laplacian. And what you are doing is to put all the bosons in the first state. OK, so you get n lambda 1. 
and that's the Bose-Einstein condensate. So the corresponding wave function is u1 l tensor n. You see that the energy is of order n over l squared. For fermions, it's different. Because of the anti-symmetry, then the fermions, maybe some eigenvalues are degenerate, depending on the form of omega, this could be. Right? So for fermions, if you have to fill the eigenvalues starting from the bottom, and you're not allowed to repeat anything except in case of multiplicity. So psi will be the Slater determinant, U1L tensor UNL. And the energy will be the sum. So you, are, you already see a big difference. Uh, the energy will not at all behave the same in the two cases. Okay, so you will not at all uh, get the same kind of. Um, and you also see, uh, so you can also compute density matrices and so on. But it's more fun if we go directly to positive temperature. So T, which is one over beta. So in this case, we said that we have to look at exponential minus beta Hn z minus 1. And now you can actually show that uh, the, the exponential minus beta lambda i, the sum converges okay, for, for any uh, bounded uh, set uh, omega. This sum will converge due so to some uh, vile estimates. It's not difficult. And so you can define the Gibbs state. Of course, you have two Gibbs states, one for fermions and one for bosons. From these Gibbs states, you can compute uh, the gamma k n with the recipe, which is on the right here. OK, so let me summarize. You take a domain. You scale it. Okay, Then you put n particles in this domain. And now we are going to do the thermodynamic limit, n to infinity, and n over l to the d converges to some rho, which is the density. And we want to know uh, what's happening. And we will have constructed an infinite quantum gas, non-interacting, where you only see the effect of the kinetic energy, so the Laplace. Uh, the only thing we've put is the Laplacian and symmetry and anti-symmetry. That's all, right? I mean, then we and I've take m equal to one half. I, I, I got rid of the one over two m, which uh, anyway I was getting wrong before many times. So let me state the the theorem. It's going to take some space. So it's a theorem that uh, everybody knows, but uh, nobody knows where it is written. I had some difficulties locating all parts of my theorem, but uh, I think it's a, it's a true theorem. So let me start with fermions. And uh, to simplify, I will only tell you what is the limit of gamma 1. Okay, But then you have the similar theorem for gamma 2, but I don't want to run into complicated formulas. So I will tell you what is happening for gamma 1. So gamma 1 n converges weakly in some sense, which I uh, will make more precise, to the following operator, exponential beta minus Laplace minus mu plus 1. OK, so this guy is an operator on L2 of Rd. OK, it's translation invariant. And 
in Fourier space, it corresponds to multiplying by 1 over exponential beta k squared minus mu plus 1. Okay, so it's a Fourier multiplier. Which means uh, an infinite translation invariant gas. Gas. And that's our free Fermi gas. Oh, yeah, I will say. Yeah. So where? Mu is a chemical potential which you have to adjust to get the... Uh, yeah, I forgot to say, so that's when n goes to infinity and n over l to the d goes to rho. Okay, so we do the thermodynamic limit. We put as many particles as the volume with the density rho. And mu is uh, the, the, the unique real number which will make so that this infinite translation uh, gas has density rho. Okay, where mu is the unique real number, so that 1 over 2 pi to the d, integral dk exponential beta k squared minus mu plus 1 is rho. Okay, and the other thing I have to tell you is what's the meaning of this limit? Okay, so I, I, I told you several times, so we have uh, infinitely many particles, so if I compute the trace or anything, it's, it's not going to work. I have to look locally. So I could say that it's a strong limit locally, something like that. So one way to... Uh, so this means... I mean, there are many different ways, but one way to do it is you pick any u in L2 of Rd, and then you project u into omega, and then you apply the operator mean, so you compute okay, so you take this function, u is in L2 of Rd, you just truncate it, forget what's, uh, what's outside, you apply this guy, you get a function in uh, L2 of uh, omega L, which you extend by zero outside, okay, and then this converges in L2 to uh, the limit times u. And that's for all u in L2 of Rt. So it's a kind of strong limit, if you like. And this is the same as saying that this operator, I uh, extend it to zero outside of omega, and then it's just a strong limit. Okay, so I get strong convergence if I apply it to a fixed vector u, which is kind of local, right? When I take a u in L2, then some of the tail doesn't matter very much, so I'm really looking locally, and then locally I see the effect of uh, this translation invariant operator, 1 over blah 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 plus 1. So this tells you that your infinite Fermi gas has uh, the, I mean, uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, this, uh, this kind of dispersion in the velocities, which is a little bit like Maxwell, but not quite because of the plus one. Okay, so if you forget the plus one, then you get Boltzmann, the usual Boltzmann E minus beta k squared minus mu. But because of the, the, the anti-symmetric nature of, uh, of uh, fermions, then you get the one over blah blah plus one. Okay? So for large k, it's the same as a uh, as Boltzmann, but for small k, not quite. Is that an okay uh, result or questions? Can I ask a very yes. short question? So, is the, the, if you apply the operator to u, do you get the function on Rd or will it be zero? No, no, no. Okay, so let, let me repeat, that's important. So, I take a u which lives over Rd, I truncate it. Okay, then I apply this operator, but this guy is only defined on omega L. So I get a function on omega L, which then I extend by zero by convention. Okay, so this function is zero by convention outside of omega L. Okay, so you have to indicate the function on the right as well? I can put an indicator function if you like, yes. But not quite. I mean, this guy only lives over omega L, so I have to 
Uh, no, because then L is infinite. There's no L anymore. I mean, there are many ways. Uh, I don't know what's the best way. I think this is fine. But you can also put an indicator here and then uh, look at the norm of the difference. So that's fermion. So you see that the limit is this operator, which is a translation invariant uh, operator, which is bounded, very nice, no problem. Whatever temperature and density, I always get a bounded operator. It's bounded by one, okay? <coughs> and uh, nothing is blowing up, nothing, uh, nothing crazy, which we knew by uh, Young anyway, <coughs> that the gamma one was less than one. But if you compute all the gamma case, they will all be bounded. I mean, okay? So uh, we know that gamma one is always bounded by Young, okay? But if I compute gamma two, I have a similar theorem, and uh, gamma 2 is bounded, and it will converge to something similar with two variables, so it's a little bit more complicated to write. So it's more fun for bosons, which is going to be our last. Uh, oh, and the, the other thing I forgot to tell you is uh, that you see that the limit is better expressed in the grand canonical formalism. This is what I wanted to do uh, to explain what's the grand canonical afterwards, but I will not have time, so I will do it on Thursday. Uh, because, I mean, the limit really depends on mu. So if you want to make it depend on rho, you have to invert this crazy function, compute mu in terms of rho, which I don't want to do. Okay. Uh, I mean, you can express this in terms of special functions, it's not fun. But uh, everything is simple if you use mu, the chemical potential, as uh, your variable, and not rho. Even though rho maybe sounds more natural in your mind, grand canonical is much easier. And let me emphasize that my mu is not the same as the mu uh, that Laura had yesterday. I think mu was e to the, to the beta my mu. But anyway, so uh, bosons. So bosons, this is much more complicated. And there you see uh, the effect of symmetry and the fact you can have Bose-Einstein condensation and so on and so forth. Uh, so let me define the critical density, uh, rho c of beta or rho c of t maybe, which is 1 over 2 pi to the d, d k e beta k squared minus 1 over rd. Uh, which is just infinite in dimension 1 and 2, and which is equal to uh, t to the d over 2 times a universal constant in dimension 3 and higher by scaling. It's an explicit constant, depending only on the dimension. Okay, Then what is happening depends whether rho is below or above uh, the, this critical density. And so maybe I write something vague. So the idea is that gamma n1 will have, so uh, you will have a, a thermodynamic part, okay, which with the usual Bose gas, if you like. So you will have beta minus Laplace minus mu minus 1. Okay, so let me emphasize that for bosons there's a minus and for fermions there's a plus. That's the only difference. And this minus is the cause of lots of problems, of course, because uh, now the denominator can vanish. So there will be a thermodynamic part, which is uh, the Bose gas, normal guy, very nice, uh, which is usually bounded. Uh, when mu is uh, negative. But uh, you see, I can never take mu uh, positive here, otherwise it blows up like crazy. So I'm forced to take mu negative. And if mu is zero, I get this density there. So that's the largest density I can reach with my Bose gas. I mean, with a nice uh, infinite Bose gas, that's the largest density I can reach. That's this critical density. If I'm forcing to have more particles than this density, then they will all condense into the first eigenfunction. So I will get L to the D 
rho minus the critical density plus. I have no, not enough space, sorry. In the U1L, U1L, and then the thermodynamic part. Okay. Where and I have to put quotation marks. Where mu, so you have two cases. So mu is uh, so that 1 over 2 pi to the d integral dk e beta k squared minus mu minus 1 is equal to rho if rho is uh, less than uh, the critical rho. And mu is equal to 0 otherwise. OK, so what this is telling you is, uh, and I have to still explain the quotation marks in the remaining five minutes. So what this is telling you is that your bother gas has two scales. OK, so in this large scale limit, you see uh, a macroscopic scale and a microscopic scale. So in the microscopic scale, you get your uh, translation invariant bother gas e to the minus beta k squared minus mu uh, minus 1. Okay, but this guy cannot have a, a very high density in dimension three and higher. It cannot have a density larger than this row here. So if you are forcing by putting too many particles, forcing a larger density, then suddenly you will have an eigenvalue of order n in gamma one, which is here, and the particles will all, uh, so the remaining particles will be in this uh, first eigenfunction of uh, the Dirichlet Laplacian in omega. And that's really a macroscopic thing because the U1L really depends on omega and the shape of, of omega and everything. This is kind of universal, you see, it doesn't depend on omega. But this depends a lot on omega. Okay, so you have two scales. So this Bose-Einstein condensation, which corresponds to having uh, an eigenvalue of order n, is also associated with two different scales. So the scale of the condensate, which is uh, macroscopic, and then the Bose gas, which is uh, microscopic. Uh, I have to tell you what the quotation mark uh, means. Uh, so one way, for instance, is uh, to, so it's, uh, I mean, this quote, is so, so it's a difficult problem now, okay? So I should not, uh, okay, so there will be an eigenvalue of this order, but there can be, and actually there will be other eigenvalues which are also very large. Okay, when I look at the second eigenvalue, it, will, it also tends to zero and it will also uh, behave uh, badly. However, the other ones uh, will be less crazy than the first one. So there will be one huge eigenvalue of order n and then many other ones uh, so smaller, still diverging, but smaller. And then if I test against a nice function, these ones are going to be average over, okay, in such a way that I will only see this part here. Okay, so, so the quotation mark here, so one way to do it is to take f in L1 and L2, the intersection of L1 and L2, and then the statement is that f gamma 1 n f uh, converges when L n go goes to infinity and n over L d goes to rho. And now it's time to remind you that u1 L is actually equal to uh, u of u1 of x over L divided by L to the d over 2. So there is a can cancellation. So you see, as an eigenvalue, it's huge. But if I test against a nice function, it's going to be of order 1. Right? Because there is a cancellation between the L to the D and uh, the L to the D over 2, which appears twice here. And what I will get is rho minus the critical rho plus times u1 of 0 squared. 
Okay, so when I test against f, this will converge to u1 of 0 squared, and then I get integral f squared. And then plus uh, the f and the nice Fermi guy, f, uh, sorry, the nice gas applied to f. Okay, so one way to uh, summarize the situation is, uh, as you can see, that if you look at the velocity distribution of your Bose gas, maybe I don't want to use a new graph, maybe I still have one minute. To Okay, so let me assume that rho is bigger than rho c of t, otherwise... Uh, okay, so what is the velocity distribution of my gas? So it's uh, 1 over e uh, beta uh, k squared minus 1 in this case. Okay, so it's exponential here, but here it behaves like 1 over beta k squared at the origin. This is what this is saying. And as you can see here, I have a Dirac delta at k equals 0, 0 momentum, right? Because the integral of f is uh, the Fourier at 0 uh, times uh, rho minus rho c uh, u1 of 0 squared. And then there's a 2 pi. Where is the 2 pi? I think I have to put 2 pi to the d. OK, so if you look at the velocity distribution of uh, your gas at the microscopic scale, then you have a Dirac delta at k equal to 0, which uh, corresponds to the condensate. And let me emphasize that the coefficient really depends on omega, or actually it depends on the, the first directly eigenfunction. So here it's zero, which appears because I centered omega at zero and scaled it. And then I took an f, which was fixed. So if you like, I am looking what's happening close to zero. Okay, because I took an f in L1 intersected with L2 and close to zero, I was looking there. Okay, so, and then I get this delta. Of course, if I look somewhere else, I will see all the possible values of u1 in omega, and they really depend on the shape of omega and everything. So that's what I see from the macroscopic scale at the microscopic scale. Very good, I have to stop. So on Thursday, what will I do on Thursday? On Thursday, I think I have, I have to talk a little bit about grand canonical, it cannot hurt. And then uh, we will do mean field limits and dilute limits for interacting systems. Thank you.